welcome to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton here. And what we're going to talk about today is using films uh, to teach about history and politics, uh, particularly in the university setting. So I've got a return guest for you guys today, Dean Allison Goff, who's the Dean of the Residential Honors Program at Hawaii Pacific University. Welcome back to Think Tech. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Well, good to have you back. Yeah. One of the things that I'm always struck by, both you and I are movie buffs, mm -hmm. and we are interested in politics and history, so we always end up talking about this subject, thinking it would be a great idea for a show. Mm -hmm. So today we thought we'd go out and actually have a show with you guys today. Uh, and so we watch a lot of movies, and I know you integrate movies when mm -hmm. you teach in the classroom and things. So we had a couple of themes that we had thought about talking about, and one was sort of this kind of transition and sort of U.S. history, um, you know, from the Great Depression through World War II into the Cold War and kind of thinking of about three or four sort of, I don't know, paradigmic mm -hmm. sort of films that illustrate a lot of themes. So you wanted to start, uh, of course, as we always want to start, in the, the sort of golden age of the Great Depression <laughs> in Hollywood, right? And one of the things that I find interesting here is that you have this apparent paradox, right? Because when we think about the Great Depression, mm -hmm. a lot of us had the stories our grandparents or maybe now our great-great-parents uh, talked to how hard life mm -hmm. was. But when you go back and you watch films of this period, they're, they're glorious and they're glamorous. And there's Fred Astaire and there's Cary Grant uh, and there's Carol Lombard. And there's all this glamour at a time that we've grown up mm -hmm. with these stories about how hard life was. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's... Doesn't that strike you perhaps as odd initially? Well, you know, talking to my grandparents, it doesn't strike me as odd. And they, they were the people who hid, you know, their money under the mattress. And my, my father, you had to persuade them to put them in the savings bank, you know, in the <laughs> 70s because they were so, you know, had such a bad experience, you know, during the Depression. But it's from my grandfather that I got a love, you know, of classic movies, particularly these screwball comedies, which really, I think, were fashioned as an antidote, you know, to the, to the Depression. And on, on the one hand, when you look at these screwball comedies, it looks like there's nothing in there that you can use, uh, you know, in a history class or a politics class to, to just sort of replicate um, uh, the period, um, because you don't see, you know, uh, the, the downside of the depression. You, you, they're not really making films about the Okies. They're not really <laughs> making films about about um, you know slums. They're not really making films about um, uh, people throwing themselves out of buildings on, on, on Wall Street. And they're not making films about the people who overwhelm were impacted by the depression, which is, you know, the, the working and middle class. Instead, most of the characters you see in there, right, are the professional classes, upper classes, etc. So you think, well, what does this have to do? What can this tell us, you know, about um, uh, the, the, the 1920s and the 1930s, the era of the Great Depression in particular? And of course, what it can tell you is something about, you know, the mindset of, of, of people there. And I think the screwball comedy really does uh, reflect um, uh, the, the ability of people to, to at least mentally rise above the Great Depression, but it also reflects um, a great deal of, um, I think, uh, government propaganda that actually was embraced by Hollywood during mm. the, that period to see them you know, through the Depression. But at the same time, when you look at these movies very closely, they are very subversive. And this is what interests me, because, of course, between uh, the beginning of film and up to the 1950s, you know, um, films were not um, protected by the First Amendment. And so they were censored, essentially. And so the movies, particularly of the 30s and 40s, which on the one hand look like, you know, they're, they're um, you know, trying to buoy the spirits of the population and say everything is normal and, you know, cheer people up. On the other hand, they're really quite subversive and they kind of presage, I think, a lot of themes that are going to emerge mm. and developments that are going to emerge um, in history in the later, uh, you know, kind of decades. I think also what's interesting about uh, the movies of the, the, the late 30s and the early uh, 40s as well, and, and the way I like to use these movies in class is that, you know, traditionally as historians and as, as political scientists, we like to use movies that illustrate, you know, great battles and mm. political events, assassination of JFK, or whatever it is, <laughs> these great movements. But I think what these movies can tell us more about uh, are, are, are things that historians really since the 60s have been more interested in, or growingly interested in, which is, you know, social history, mm. um, uh, the history of, you know, people who traditionally didn't make it into the political record. So I think movies are, are useful in the 30s and 40s for kind of documenting that side uh, of history. So I know we're going to talk about you know how um, uh, these movies influence you know politics and how they reflect politics, but I also think these are movies that serve both as documentaries of you know a social history and also kind of artifacts of social mm. history. And I think that's two interesting ways to see movies. I think. 
oftentimes students think of you know hi, um, uh, movies that deal with historical topic as a kind of documentary you know, if, even if they're fiction uh, what I like to encourage my students to do is to look at the movies themselves as artifacts right yeah. of, of explaining you know a particular time in history so you know today we're going to talk about movies of the 40, uh, 30s and 40s whereas I think most of our students want to watch contemporary movies about past events mm. but I don't always think that that's the best thing for kind of getting them into the zeitgeist if you want yeah. of a particular yeah. Era. So I think I think this is this is something that historians need to do more and more. Actually, look to more classic movies as mm. ways of illustrating the past, and you know, looking at movies from you know, like the eighties um, uh, onwards. There's a very um, interesting study actually done. <coughs> about student attitudes and what they take away from movies and um, an historian whose, whose name I'm sorry escapes me at the moment had his students watch uh, Dances with Walls which I'm sure most people are familiar with and The Searchers which a lot of people are not familiar with and he had them watch Dances with Walls first and they just lapped it up you know lock stock and barrel everything there was historically accurate etc cetera, etc cetera. and this was done in the 90s and um, you know he kind of theorized that one of the things that students like is that movies that are made contemporaneous to them they understand because they use the sort of tropes and they use mm. um, viewpoints and visuals that are very you know kind of current to them and this he posited led to their um, you know kind of ability to or <laughs> lack of ability to be critical right about the historical content of the movie so we then you know showed them the searchers you know which they thought was a terrible movie because it lacked all the visual glam you know of, of, of modern movies and of course it has you know attitudes in there towards Native Americans and women that were very reflective of the time period in which it was made. So they hated that about the movie. But once they'd watched The Searchers and then watched the modern movie again, they were likely to be far more critical of Dances with Wolves. So oh. I think this is a very interesting way to <laughs> use, you know, classic mm. movies, even though um, from a modern perspective they're flawed in their attitudes, particularly towards women and minorities or whatever, or so it seems, in order to be critical of more modern movies, which they might tend to think are more factually and historically accurate. So that's one of the reasons I'm glad we're talking about classic movies, because I <laughs> think we can use them in that mm. way uh, as, as a kind of backdrop to, to modern movies. So he, th this guy suggests that when you're incorporating Incorporating movies into teaching history or politics, that you actually try to balance, you know, an older film with a modern film, and it mm. makes students more critical um, uh, about um, uh, analysing the historical and political content. So, mm. um, because people are always very. Um, uh, wary about using right films in classes. I mean, some people see it just as a way for people just to sit there, teachers to sit there and put their feet up when they haven't got anything better to do. But you know, actually incorporating films into into classes requires a great deal of thought. Yeah. Um, I, I think, and I, I, I like this guy's idea of using the balance between these two movies. And most of my students, of course, don't know any movies really pre two thousand now. Yeah. So when you ask them to watch, you know, like um, um, you know, Bringing Up Baby from nineteen thirty eight, or you ask them to watch uh, the third man from that's 49 mm. right they're, they're absolutely askance at this but they're very good movies to use i think to illustrate mm. you know certain social and political trends in the past well one thing also kind of a flip side i find i think oftentimes for professors because we're older than mm -hmm. our students you know the generational shifts are not as apparent so often i'll have colleagues say well i'll never show anything really old to the students i'll just show them something from the 80s yeah well, okay, for you, maybe that's a recent exactly. movie. Uh, yeah, but that yeah. movie was probably yeah. made before mm -hmm. most of mm -hmm. our students were born. Yeah. And I find the, the actual shift for the students, I mean, to get them to watch something like, oh, I don't know, broadcast news from the, mm -hmm. the 80s versus having them watch His Girl Friday, it's not very functionally different for them. It's a historical right, artifact. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. whether it's from 1940 yeah. or 1980. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I think oftentimes we lose track of that because we mm -hmm. remember a movie from the, like Dances with Wolves for most I know that today. is ancient that's now ancient. yeah that's why I said the study was done in the <laughs> 90s it wasn't done now so I, I couldn't find a study that was done more recently mm. but I think that that kind of holds yeah and uh, you know the, the virtue as well of using these older films is is um, you know film in general you know speaks to people more than reading a history text unfortunately yeah. but um, it, the way it can speak to them is is I think to making them understand if you, if you get them to critically analyze it that, that history 
history or politics is not this, you know, kind of Whiggish linear, you know, kind mm. of move from, you know, backwardness <laughs> to enlightenment. <laughs> so, I mean, I like to use movies like um, Bringing Up Baby and His Girl Friday, for mm. example, that kind of illustrate actually the kind of um, gen uh, gender ambiguity, you know, in yep. the 30s and, the, and in the 40s, because, you know, there's this notion that, 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 that the feminism is a 60s, post 60s, you know, mm. kind of phenomenon. And of course, it, it isn't, and it goes back, you know, centuries, couple of centuries before that but there's a great um, kind of ambiguity about feminism in these um, movies and when you carefully look at them mm -hmm. um, these movies are really kind of uh, subverting you know gender roles there and I think they really uh, reflect uh, the kind of um, ambivalence that people were feeling about gender roles in the context of the depression and the context of World War II which demanded from women and from men that they shift right, mm -hmm. their roles and their perceptions of those roles although there was a great deal of resistance you know uh, to that so I know you're familiar with both mm -hmm. of those movies right now Howard Hawks movies mm -hmm. and, um, people often accuse him of being a feminism some a feminist something that you push back <laughs> against and said no I just find women interesting and enthralling uh, but you can read them mm -hmm. you know uh, um, in, in, in in that way and if you look at both of those movies in bringing up baby which is uh, Catherine Hepburn and, and mm. Cary Grant and then um, his girl Friday which is again Cary Grant and the uh, fantastic Rosalind Russell mm. um, one those of your heroes one of my, one of my <laughs> heroes <laughs> then th they really do try to subvert relationships between men and women in, in, in very mm. kind of different ways so in bringing up baby which is I think one of the best screwball comedies of all time quite frankly and, and Catherine Hepburn I think just had great comic timing you know and with Cary Grant the chemistry is fantastic. Uh, you know, you have this woman, um, Catherine Hepburn, who seems to have no relationship with the Depression whatsoever, right? right? She's this heiress, she's very rich, she doesn't have a job, she's living off the family uh, fortune, and um, uh, the, the comedy revolves around her and um, uh, the character pay, played by um, uh, Cary Grant. David Huxley, I think his mm. name is right, who's this this bookish, you know, professor who digs up dinosaur bones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And somewhere in there, there's a leopard involved, which is the baby, you know, in, in the title. And in this movie, she very much is the aggressor. Oh yeah, she, yeah. she chases. She after chases him. him. It's like right? Pepe Le Pew. Yeah, absolutely, right? <laughs> completely. <laughs> and you know, from the get-go, she is the center of that story. You know, mm. one of the opening scenes, you know, takes place in a masculinized environment. It's on the golf course, right? Mm -hmm. But there can be no more masculinized environment environment in the 30s, quite mm -hmm. frankly, and then the golf course. And she drives this shot, you know, down the fairway between um, uh, David and the fellow who's talking to about business. Again, this is a very masculinized world. And she's right in the center, you know, um, uh, of that. And she remains in the center throughout the rest of the movie. And then she, you know, she's just this character that brings utter chaos here, <laughs> right? Which I think is a metaphor for, you know, the subversion of, the, of these relationships. Because if you think about it, how many things does she break right. during that movie, right? First of all, she breaks his car, right? She mm -hmm. takes his car by mistake and dents it and whatever. She breaks his glasses, right? And then ultimately, at the very end of the movie, she like breaks the dinosaur right. <laughs> that he's trying to put together. So this is all very metaphorical for the for the the breaking of the traditional relationships between men and women. Now, what does that have to do with the depression? That was a rhetorical question. I'll answer right. it. But, then, but what I think. So I try to get my my students to you know see this in the mm -hmm. context of the depression when um, you know between 1930 and 1940 two million more women entered uh, the workforce mm. than had been there, there before and that was out of you know necessity most of the jobs to go first were the jobs in heavy industry which were gendered right as male and the the female gendered jobs in 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 clerical work uh, in particular did not witness you know a contraction during the war so women as a proportion of the workforce really increased and oftentimes it was only the woman of the family who could get a job um, and the percentage of married women who were working throughout the 1930-1940 uh, period doubled so that was an enormous shift right mm. um, in, 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 in the workplace but it's not only a shift right it's a shift in traditional family patterns and gendered patterns you know mm. no longer is the guy seen as the breadwinner in actuality uh, the woman is out there often keeping uh, you know the family together and you know there were rules during World War two in, in America where you can only have one you know breadwinner in the family so oftentimes that was the woman who was mm. doing that because she could find uh, uh, work at the same time however okay um, organizations like the CCC mm. and other you know um, um, uh, public works programs that were set up under the New Deal 
banned women from participating, so the CCC would only allow men, for example. And uh, they really try to um, kind of perpetuate the idea of man as breadwinner. Mm. In, in reality, you know, this wasn't, you know, kind of happening. So there's this tension in 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 in. Um, the depression between you know reality and and theory and i think that is nicely illustrated in 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 these in these movies mm. and i think uh, there's a kind of um, proto-feminism going mm. on in the depression and in world war ii that although it seems to get quashed in the 1950s kind of retrenchment and you know what betty friedan would call the feminine mystique is actually just going underground and kind of re-emerges in the 1960s so i like to encourage my students to see these movies in these ways the, his girl Fry is a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? Because in this movie, Hildy, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll just have is a, a career short, woman. A short, we'll come back and yeah, talk sure, about that. Yeah, sure, Vic. Talk about his girl <laughs> All right, thank you. We'll have a sh couple of announcements of other think tech programs. Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna. I hope you please visit us this summer. It's a wonderful summer. It's actually a cooler summer than we're used to. But I hope that you come back and visit us and watch our show, Education, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, here on Think Tech Hawaii. It's at noon every Wednesday. See you then. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We're giving you the best tips and with our best health coach here. So, Viva Health Coach. Viva la comida saludable. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. You're watching SyncTech Hawaii on SyncTechHawaii.com, which broadcasts six live talk shows from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from SyncTech. Hello, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm talking with Dean Allison Goff about using films to teach history and politics. Before the break, we were talking about some of Howard Hawks' great movies, the screwball comedies in particular, uh, Bringing a Baby and His Girl Friday. And so before the break, you were talking about the, the, the aspects of these movies being somewhat subversive mm -hmm. within terms of gender and societal roles, where oftentimes people nowadays, you know, we have a what I call a sort of presentist hu hubris in a mm -hmm. sense that, you know, in a sense, I think not to skip media for for a second uh, with you but I mean if you look at a lot of the attention of why a lot of people liked watching a show like Mad Men in mm -hmm. a sense was that you could sh show how gender roles or race relations were back in the 60s and I think a lot of it was for people today to watch that oh see how far we've yeah. come since those <laughs> barbaric yeah. times yeah. Uh, in, in a sense and I, I think maybe what you're drawing on is that um, it, actually it's much more complicated than mm -hmm. that. I, I think absolutely. I, mm. I mean, I love Mad Men too, but I think it was a very simplistic kind of presentation of gender roles in there. And of course, when we, we talk about gender roles, we always focus on women, right? But we need to focus on the male mm. equation uh, in, in this as well. And we, we were talking about, you know, the evolution of male roles like that of, of William Powell. Right? Mm. And in the post-war era, they become a lot more you know, masculine and hard-boiled, where you would expect it to be the other way around if you're talking about a linear, you know, kind mm. of progression to the modern progressive, you know? Right. Kind, of, kind, of, kind of male. So we have to remember when we're talking about gender relations, it is, you know, multi kind of faceted here. It's not just to, um, you know, do with women. But yes, I think there are a lot more uh, complicated the relationships. And we, we were going to talk, you know, about, about his girl Friday mm -hmm. before the break. And, you know, the, the, one of the central characters in that, Hildy, is, is a very interesting character. Um, you know, on, on the surface, the, the movie looks as if it's, it's a commentary on the kind of binary relationships between men, you know, and, and and women, um, but in the character of Hildy, she simultaneously, you know, w rejects the patriarchy, but she wants to be a part of it right. <laughs> as well. And and she's referred to as a female newspaper man, you know, right. in, in the movie. So she has this kind of dual identity and, and double consciousness. And of course, in the end, she she doesn't go and live out in Albany with her insurance salesman, you know, husband. Instead, she goes back to her ex-husband. Um, 
And, and she also has a career as well. Mm. And that looks very feminist on the surface, but of course all throughout the movie, Cary Grant's character, her editor, is manipulating her mm -hmm. basically into, into kind of doing this. So this is a very complicated, I think, movie and a, a very complex commentary on gender relationships. It's not really binary at all. It's not really, mm. you know, black and black and white and black and white. So I, I like the movie for, for that reason. The, the, you know, I mean, the characters in some way are unbelievable, but they do think think they reflect the complexity of, of people's you know feelings and I think that students don't quite appreciate that people actually were people in the, in the past that <laughs> right. you know complexity did exist mm. then you know politically but also personally um, and and um, you know this is a good way of getting them to kind of see these multifaceted kind of aspects of relationships um, mm. I think but again that's a movie that I think reflects the you know ambiguity of gender roles that the depression then of course World War II uh, brought on when women moved by necessity more and more not just into the workforce but into quote unquote men's jobs as mm. well and of course Hildy is in a man's job you know um, in, in that movie a movie as a newspaper uh, uh, man female uh, newspaper female man. newspaper <laughs> man yeah um, female journalists of course during the depression were some of the first ones to be put out of business mm. so the movie doesn't really touch upon that but that probably had some sort of resonance you know with with professional women who were kind of watching that mm. movie I think her kind of struggle to get back in actually to the business I think would have been a very interesting commentary for them Mm -hmm. Well, one thing you, you mentioned that we had talked about before, I mean, the one I always find fascinating is this transformation of William Powell, mm -hmm. right? So in the 30s, he's in all of these uh, sort of fantastic musicals, these yeah. Busby Berkeley <laughs> musicals, where his character from um, even a modern day um, sort of interpretation seems somewhat effeminate. Mm -hmm. He sings with a high-pitched voice, mm -hmm. he's smiley, he's free to dance, and all the sorts of things that, you know, modern day perspective, you know, people are always oh, this Liberace-like yeah, character yeah. that he is. World War II happens, you know, America mobilizes, mm -hmm. goes to war, fights the Nazis, fights Imperial Japan, comes back home, and then you have this rise of this sort of film noir genre. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, William Powell goes from, you know, being a well-dressed man with a flower in his lapel, you know, singing, to sort of a tough-talking private eye is ready mm -hmm. to, you yep. know, face down, you know, killers and, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, a, it's like a night and day mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. thing, even though it's only probably about a four-year period in terms yeah. of, of films. I mean, with the rise of sort of this film noir, in a sense, I mean, reflecting, would you say, that America's experience in World War II and coming back to this sort of new Cold War, in a sense? Yeah, or? I think there's several things going mm. on there, and you can use these movies both to look at social history and political history as well. On the one hand, you know, the, the establishment of the, the, the tough, you know, pulp fiction, you know, detective, Sam Spade and everything else is a reestablishment, an attempt to reestablish, you know, traditional, you know, kind of gender roles. But on the other hand, there are very strong broads, right? right. <laughs> these, these, tough these talking movies too, right. tough talking dames, right, who want to kill off their husbands in double indemnity or <laughs> whatever, right? And, and they often, and, and, and that, that's also an interesting thing that I think leads into the discussion about the, the Cold War and some movies there. Film noir of the post-war period is very morally ambiguous. Mm. And I think that's a reflection, particularly of Cold War politics that is going on. And, and you can look at that, um, I think if you look at, you know, Casablanca and you look at The Third Man, mm -hmm. which are, you know, Casablanca's, uh, what, released Thanksgiving 1942, mm -hmm. I think, right? Um, and then uh, The Third Man 1949, I think, I think that's when it is. And um, it's interesting, you can already see the evolution of characters is there, of course, you know, the Sam Spade character, right? <laughs> Rick, um, uh, Humphrey Bogart is a central character in Casablanca, and he's a man with some moral ambiguity, right, mm. in, in that movie, and he's holing out in, in, in Casablanca, and he has really allegiances to nobody apart from himself, he says, and to his em em employees. Um, and, you know, there's that moral ambiguity there, but of course, by the end of the movie, he's chosen his side, and, um, you know, he's come out of isolation and he's willing to give up the love of his life and, and, and go and help the allies. Of course that's a metaphor for America, right? right. In, uh, in the war ending the isolation and, and making friends again, you know, with Britain and, and coming out there. And, you know, the, the, one of the most famous lines in the movie, where there are so many, when he says to, you know, Louis, you know, this is going to be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I mean, mm. that's the re-establishment, right? Mm. Anglo-French rapprochement, right? Uh, right there. 
and so his his character by the end of Casablanca, of course, is is not totally cyn um, um, cynical. Um, he's not totally morally ambiguous. But then you look at a film like The Third Man, mm -hmm. which is now in forty nine. The war is over. The Cold War has started, and you know, um, well, the central character there, even though he doesn't appear till halfway through the <laughs> film, right, is Harry Lyme. Right. And this is a morally ambiguous uh, man. I mean, he's really a rat. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, all the scenes of the sewers are meant to kind of metaphor kind of um, convey that and and um, you know the whole setting of the third man and the whole way they lit the movie the fact that they actually went to Vienna and filmed it you know there there was a big fight about that mm. apparently but they went there so they you know all the rubble you see and everything there is you know actually Vienna I mean it creates again this chaotic very uh, ambiguous you know kind of situation and and in, in kind of contrast to the optimism right of Casablanca mm. that you see at the end there's very little optimism right, right. Um, in this. Everybody's selling each uh, each other out. Um, the film uses shadows a great deal. I mean, that's very emblematic of the way people were already seeing the Cold War. It's full of paranoia. It's full of mistrust. Um, it's full of um, uh, conflicts between people who were supposedly before allies. Mm. And Vienna embodies that, right, with right. The, the city being split up into the four um, zones. Um, and, and I believe, you know, the, the, the the director and writer, well, Graham Greene, obviously, but the, the director, um, you know, went there on a tour beforehand and then kind of sketched out the screenplay oh. after it actually kind of been there. And he talked to everybody in all of the sectors about what was going on. So, mm. it was, he, you know, his, it's, the movie very much is part of his experience as well as Graham Greene's experience as well. I think the, the thing you talked about, the moral ambiguity, I mean, there's that great speech, of course, that yeah. Barry Lyme has when they're on the, <laughs> the, the, on the first <laughs> world in Praetor. And he talks about the comparison, mm -hmm. what is it, the um, if you look at the northern Italy during the um, mm -hmm. during the Renaissance, Renaissance yeah. compared to Switzerland, mm -hmm. so Switzerland was a democracy, and they only gave us it's the cuckoo, cuckoo clock. clock. Yeah. But in this other place, they had violence, deception, horrible <laughs> things, but great art <laughs> and the birth of Western <laughs> civilization. So it was all worth it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm. I, th th that's just such a great movie, you know. And I encourage my students to see it, you know, as part, you know, historical, you know, artifact, mm. also as, as a metaphor um, as well. The way the film was shot, although we didn't want to talk about, you know, camera angles and stuff <laughs> like that. But the way the first time we see Harry Lyme, he's in the shadows, right? Mm. And he gradually kind of comes out to them. And there's been all these hints that he's there. I mean, that is Cold War paranoia right there right. On, the, on, on the screen. Mm. Um, so I, I think this was... Um, very conscious, uh, a very consciously made mm. film. And of course, all the people who were involved had been involved in some way, right, in the intelligence mm. services before and during and after the war. So obviously, Graham Greene, you know, he was a sometime spy. His sister was an MI6. His best friend was um, uh, Kim Philby, oh. who, who actually, his oh, real name was the... Harold. So oh. we think Harry Lyme kind of came from. Oh, from, from one of the Cambridge Five. Okay, yeah, yeah, so him. And then. Um, uh, Korda, mm -hmm. yeah, who was made, who's um, Hungarian British, right? Uh, the producer, one of the producers, um, was knighted, you know, by 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 the the British monarchy. So he's Sir Alexander Korda, and it was ostensibly for services to British film, uh, but in reality, many historians think that it was rather in service oh. to <laughs> the intelligence service because he ran a film company out mm. of Vienna before, during, and after the war, which was probably a cover for you know oh. intelligence and espionage. Oh, <laughs> so th these people who made the movie were very deeply embedded, you know, in the Cold War, mm -hmm. which of course as historians and political scientists, we would argue, obviously started way before World War II sure. in many ways. So, I mean, these people are presaging in many ways what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the 40s and 50s, I think, and in, in a visual way and in, in telling stories they've already been part of yeah. um, even before the war started. Nice. Mm -hmm. I think we could go for another hour, oh. uh, but we've got to uh, draw it to a close. Oh. Uh, but maybe we can do this again, that I think. I yes. think that would be fun. We have a lot more to talk about. <laughs> I, I, I imagine that you do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us on, on Global Connections. Thank you, for Allison, thank you. for coming. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week.